All right, let's start. Uh, my name is Helen He of Nurse User Training. Welcome to the OpenMP Training Series Session 6 today, Advanced OpenMP Offload Topics. Um, so, as you know, we have had five sessions already. And today is session six, and there will be a final session on select and the remaining topics on October 28. You can find the links to slides, exercise, and the recordings of previous sessions <coughs> on our event webpage. And also the GitHub repo contains the exercise and slides uh, as well. Uh, we are really lucky to have our two true OpenMP experts, Michael and Christian, both of OpenMP Language Committee members among a, a group of experts who routinely give technical talks and tutorials on OpenMP. They're both book authors as well. Um, I'll let the slide sit for another 15 seconds. If you... Um... All right, so logistics for today, everyone is muted. Please change your name to first name and last name. And um, this closed caption is turned on so you can toggle on and off and you can also save and view uh, full transcripts. As you know, as you can see, we're recording this session. So feel free to unmute and ask questions. If you prefer not uh, to record your voice, you can type questions in the Slack channel. Um, Slack channel questions are preferred over Zoom chat because those are uh, um, saved, archived. Uh, we have uploaded slides for today onto the GitHub repo and the ring, uh, recording will be available uh, in a few days later. The Slack channel, I will post the Slack channel um, in this Zoom chat. If you haven't joined yet, please join the Slack. And we'll also provide a survey link to help please answer the survey, a quick survey to help us improve. So with that, I'm going to pass uh, on to Christian to start the training today. Can you see my screen, Helen? Yes. That's good. Okay, so thank you and uh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to session six of the advanced. Uh, and today's topic is advanced uh, open MP offloading. So the, the slide is still missing one update. So there's a session seven actually planned for, um, I think it's end of October. Yeah, we will verify that later on, which will cover some selected topics plus a leftover from uh, what we no were not able to cover today and uh, in session four. And uh, we will come back uh, to that towards the very end. So today's topics is um, really what you need in order to get good performance on a GPU. So we will start with unstructured data movement. And uh, to some extent, it's a review of what we presented last month, yeah, something like four weeks ago. But uh, because this is really important, yeah, I will quickly go over that uh, or through that material again. And uh, then I will present asynchronous offloading. Uh, and then Michael will take over talking about integration of GPU kernels. That means something that you wrote natively with CUDA or in this particular example, HIP. And uh, he will talk about real world application case studies, yeah, putting it all together. And uh, if time permits, we could also talk about detachable GPU tasks. That's a general concept of OpenMP uh, to inter uh, incorporate support for asynchronous APIs like CUDA or HIP or maybe even MPI. Otherwise, we will cover exactly that uh, next time. And uh, we also still have on our to-do list to complete this chapter on uh, SIMD. Finally, yeah, there's one brief homework assignment comment but before we dive into the data movement let me comment on uh, the solutions of the previous homework tasks um, and uh, while i'm going to present this this is your opportunity to think about our material and uh, see 
if you have any questions. So I'm sure Michael is looking at Slack. I I, I do not yeah, at the moment. And if you raise any questions, uh, we will answer those before we actually dive in into the new uh, material. So last time uh, we looked at the Jacobi code uh, and in previous webinars already in the context, for example, NUMA and work sharing. And last time I said, try to bring it to the GPU and uh, start with a, let me call it naive or intuitive approach to just offload one loop and then improve the situation by offloading two loops and then uh, adding a data region. And uh, the remaining homework is then to do everything you can in order to make it run uh, faster. So the solutions are part of our source code distribution, but uh, here I would like to uh, just quickly um, review the most important part of this solution. So this is a basic, yeah, I think I call it naive or intuitive approach. You look at what is the most time consuming loop, which is this one, yeah, iteration from one to n, um, or zero to n minus, uh, so you know, one to n minus one, yeah. And uh, also in the other direction, uh, we do the copy, yeah, that means a stencil uh, based access yeah, and do some mass function here. The other loop, which is not parallelized in this very uh, simple approach, is then copying the uh, new solution into the buffer yeah, to then iter continue in the next iteration. So we say target teams distribute parallel four. Remember last time I talked about the hierarchical structure of a GPU. Yeah, you have, depending on the vendor, yeah, you have um, cores grouped to blocks and then uh, execution engines execute, uh, capable of executing multiple blocks. This is what you also have to uh, exploit in your parallelism, but OpenMP allows you to use those combined constructs so that you do not necessarily have um, uh, to apply the teams and then the distribute and then the parallel four to individual loops, but let this work uh, or put this responsibility of this work to the compiler. So teams partitions a loop yeah, so that multiple teams with only one initial thread per team will be started. Yeah, and we have a certain whatever blocking or chunking in there, distributes, um, continues with it, and parallel four finally starts all those threads of those teams yeah, that we have actually parallelism and that and that we have this, uh, I think I called it the three-dimensional structure ready. We need a reduction. Yeah? Remember, I think maybe the first or the second topic. Yeah? So error is being read. Yeah? Here it's consumed and written in every iteration. So if you would make it private, yeah? that would be uh, wrong. So we need a reduction. Here we use the maximum operator. Static, uh, uh, sorry, a non monotonic static schedule is an optimization with respect. Uh, to how the distributions are being distributed, uh, iterations are being distributable on the GPU. Yeah? So it eliminates or minimizes synchronization. We will cover that uh, to some extent later. So sorry, this is probably not part uh, of the simplest uh, solution. But we have the map here. We have to map A from the host to the device. And at the end of the computation, we have to map a new uh, back from the device to the host. And the same is true for error. If you want to improve that, remember last time we need a data region. So that means this data remains on the device for a longer period than just a single kernel uh, invocation. So see here we have this while loop. Yeah? So that means uh, we do a couple of thousand, oops, I'm sorry, iterations typically. So here we spend the data loop. That means mapped is mapped from the host to the device once. Yeah? And uh, the same is true for alloc, uh, a new, sorry. And then we uh, execute two kernels here. That's the second improvement in this version. So this loop and that loop, uh, again, with uh, teams distribute parallel four. Uh, and that's, that's a reasonable uh, performance. So I wanted to, to bring fresh measurements. Actually, um, we I, I didn't have the chance to present this course when, with our uh, current system yeah, with Hopper GPUs available. However, I was traveling and uh, didn't have access to our system, nor any else. So I had to bring uh, performance numbers from an old system. Yeah? So don't compare that with your system. 
this is where do I find it? It's in a Tesla V100. That's a Volta generation. After Volta, we had Ampere, and after Ampere, we have uh, what's state of the art on uh, uh, in Nvidia, the Hopper architecture. So quite outdated. Yeah. So keep that in mind when comparing performance numbers. And uh, also, you see, this is from a few years ago, from 21. Yeah, with some reasonably old claim uh, on a cent of seven based uh, Linux. Yeah? So today you will get better results. But task one, yeah, just parallelize the one most computed intensive loop. Yeah, brings you from a single um, or single threaded execution on the host to a runtime on the GPU of 144.9, let's say 145 seconds yeah so this is executing one kernel on the device but doing the data transfer in every iteration and i believe this the standard data set also has something like 2000 iterations yeah? then improves the data management yeah that means at it, uh, at the data region so we go down from 145 to let's say 7.9 seconds and then optimize the scheduling of the iterations for the GPU. Then we go down to 5.5. I believe this also includes the parallelization of the other kernel, yeah? because otherwise the data uh, region would not have a lot of uh, effect because we would need uh, to copy the result um, back after every execution of the kernel. Yeah, so from what was it, 145 to 5.5, just with a few clauses, uh, and the construct that means introducing the data uh, region. And this underlines what we said earlier, that the management of the data is important when it comes to performance on the GPU. That was my review of the homework. Any questions in the chat, the Slack, or where, anywhere else? I don't see it in the Zoom chat. Helen or Michael, can you give me an update regarding the Slack? I don't see any questions. Very good. Then let's begin with uh, today's topic. So 6.15, that means we're pretty good in time. Oops. OK. Let me rearrange my window here so that I can actually see the screen. OK. So as I said, let's uh, to some extent extend, but also quickly review um, the management of uh, data in the context of multiple target regions or multiple uh, kernel uh, offloads. So the goal is to optimize um, the data sharing between host and dev the device and optimization. optimizing that means to minimize the amount of data that has to be transferred. Yeah? So on that old system that I showed earlier, the GPUs were connected to the host with a PCI Express bus yeah? and although Modern PCI Expresses are faster and they're even better connections. Yeah, this is still, or this still can be a bottleneck, in particular in iterative uh, codes. So we have the target data construct as a construct that spun, spans a data region yeah, with a start at the curly brace and the end of the corresponding closing um, curly brace. And these data management target constructs map only variables, they do not offload the code. That means they do not transfer the uh, control flow. However, there are a couple of places where the target data construct is not flexible enough. Yeah? Think of a, a initialization routine that's meant to put some data onto a device and then the finisher or cleanup routine that's meant to get the results back. And this is why we need unstructured data movement constructs. And this is what we have in the context, uh, in, in the forms of target enter data and target exit data. Yeah, I have an example um, a little bit later. But the goal is that we can decoupling the creation, that means the lifespan of the target data region, yeah, with the actual places in the source code in which data is being mapped from the host to the device or mapped from the device back uh, to the host. Yeah? And uh, I hope now you can see my uh, laser pointer here. So in particular, if you have to map multiple data, so this is not only useful, but I would say critical for uh, performance. What I believe what we briefly mentioned last time is a target update construct that uh, 
um, or the statement yeah, that can synchronize a variable between the host and the device depending on the direction uh, with, uh, that is indicated with the corresponding clauses. So I have an additional code example on that. Let me skip over this uh, slide. Yeah. Uh, so target update is what we introduced with the clauses. Uh, here we do not have a map clause with to and from as a directional specifier, but we have a to list and a from list. To means host to device, from means uh, device to host, yeah? if called from the host. This is more interesting. So here we have a target enter data and exit data. Um, <coughs> Sorry, construct. So enter data maps data from the host to the device. It accepts the map clause yeah, with the typical modifiers that you already know. We can specify a certain device with an integer ID expression, and we can add an if clause. Yeah. And uh, what's even so that means we can do it depending on the condition. I'm sorry. And what's more important is we have the depend clause. Yeah. We will come back to that. Uh, in a few minutes when we talk about asynchronous offloading. But you know dependencies already from tasking, and I believe, or at least I hope I promised that when we were discussing, yeah, we will uh, revisit or review this concept um, when we talk about asynchronous device offloading, because tasks yeah, by, the, uh, by definition are asynchronous. So let's let's put this into code examples. Yeah, as, a, as I said, the combination of a review and new uh, stuff. Oh, let me complete that here. The host thread yeah, creates the, uh, the data environment on the device. Yeah? This is being executed by the host. I think, yes, we have that here on the right-hand side. Here we have a um, routine called some computation that's probably consuming input. Yeah? Uh, and this is being executed on the host, don't care about uh, efficiency here. Here we have a target, that means this is being executed on the device. Sorry, I hope I said device, not host. Blue means we do some other stuff on the host, yeah? and then red, we do something on the device again, and this is the end of the target uh, region. Yeah? So if we have, are using input here, and so where is there? Um, so we map, we allocate TMP and map um, input here. So that means this is being done at the beginning of the ta uh, target data region yeah, and also uh, map. And uh, the data is being cleaned up um, at the end of the target data region. So some computation consumes input, produces TMP. We do something on the host, but TMP remains on the device and then TMP, sorry, here is consumed in final computation, yeah, delivering maybe something like a um, residual or result in here, which is then uh, mapped back. Yeah? And because input uh, was mapped with a two modifier and TMP was only allocated on the device, this data is not being transferred back in any form. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now let's assume yeah, we, we do something like this. Yeah? We have data, uh, the data region created by the host. Uh, we do computation on the device, on the host, but something happens so that, that we have to um, execute an update yeah, in one or maybe even both directions. Yeah? So take a look at the slightly modified example here. We have the same uh, target data region. Yeah? However, yeah, this time we have a two from res here. Uh, we made it explicit. TMP is being produced with some computation, again, consuming input. We execute update input array on the host. Well, that's a very self-speaking name. So the uh, input array is being updated on the host. And uh, for whatever reason, yeah, this is, has now been uh, mapped back from the host to the device. This is what we have the OMP target update for not with a map, but with a two clause to actually take input, maybe even only a slice of it yeah, to improve efficiency, if we can specify that from the host to the device. So that means uh, a map, a TMP, sorry, remains on the device for the whole time. Input remains there, but is being updated from the host uh, to the device and then consumed here. 
So typically, yeah, I, I try to indicate that um, if you want to improve efficiency, you should update only a slice of it, namely the slide that's being updated on the host. So while this is all nice, yeah, remember what's happening here when we do a target. Yeah, this is what we try to illustrate here. The control flow is um, uh, whatever directed from the host to the device, and that means the host is basically waiting. Yeah? It's waiting for the compute kernel to complete and then finally to update the input array on the host. Modern marketing would say the host is uh, saving energy, but at the end of the day, it's not contributing to the solution of your computational problem. This is not uh, desirable. So um, uh, in, in, a, in a few seconds, yeah, we will talk about the asynchronous offloading. Before we do that, sorry, I guess I forgot. Yeah? Let me talk about target enter data and target exit data. Yeah? Let's take a look at this code snippet here with the target data region that starts here and ends there. Yeah? We should probably also color that closing brace red. It maps P from the host, uh, sorry, it maps P back from the device to the host. Here we have a first kernel yeah, that maps v1 and v2 from the host to the device. Then we do something on the host. Yeah? Again, we do an initialization or something like that. Execute the second kernel and uh, call a function called output again on uh, the host. Yeah? So v1 and v2 are mapped at each target construct. P is mapped um, uh, once by the target data construct. Yeah? I said it at the end of the kernel. So this is a structured mapping. So that means the target data region begins here, ends there, and all the mapping is being done in here. Um, but this is not always what we want. Yeah? So let's, let's take a look at, uh, at a slightly more complicated code example. Let's assume we have a function called init here yeah, that's doing something with v1 and v2. So if you want, uh, um, within a yeah, vector multiplication, uh, code in here. So if you want to make use of an existing code structure, and I think the best example are C++ uh, classes that contain a construct and a destructor, where within a constructor we do some initialization of the data, and maybe in a destructor we um, get our results back from the device to the host, we need unstructured um, data constructs. So that means the mapping yeah, has to take place outside of the target. Uh, data region and also of an actual kernel. Yeah? And that's a difference here. So here we have the pragma omp target enter data as a uh, single line statement with a map clause that allocates P on the device. And here we have the pragma omp target exit map single line statement that maps P back from the device to the uh, host. So this is being executed not at the beginning of the target uh, or uh, end of the target data structure, not when you actually launch a kernel, but then yeah, when it's necessary in the, in the code, that means when this particular pragma um, appears here. Yeah? So still, yeah, at each target construct, v1 and v2 are being uh, mapped, yeah? but uh, p is what we have changed uh, in this particular code in here, yeah? because init might do, uh, is, is doing possibly something here as well. So target enter data, target exit data, um, implement unstructured data movement uh, in OpenMP. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, of course. So where's your declaration for P? Like you, you have a lock for the GPU, but there exists a P also on the host, right? Let me just see in this example. So we allocate uh, p on the on the device. Where's my declaration for that? That's somewhere else. That's a good point. So we have it here. Um, that's a declaration, yeah, in in as an argument possibly in the vector mult function. So this is being allocated on the device. And I think last time I talked about the let's say to some extent clever runtime, yeah. So it maps this p. Yeah, as a so it knows that this has an address on the host and on the device. So that means within the kernel, this p here is this p that has been allocated on the device. 
Right, so, but you just said there's a, a pointer also on the host for P. There's a P on the host and P on the GPU. On yes. The okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yes, so, so there's a P on the host and there's a P on the device. And here, yeah, we take the device piece content, yeah, and put it pro probably, I don't know the implementation of output, yeah, but that could, it, that could be it into the P on the host. That means here's a result being uh, made available on the host. Yeah? This is a target exit map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, question. I may have a comment on this. Of so course. you can you can also view the um, map entering construct like target ender data um, and the map exiting um, constructs like exit target exit data, um, as well as the opening curly brace of a target data construct and the closing curly brace as kind of the transfer of ownership. So while um, something is mapped to the target device, you probably, you know, you need to be very careful if you actually read that um, those, those values, um, because you may, you know, while the system is may still be transferring stuff, or in some implementations, like if you have unified shared memory, um, the host data structure and the thing that is on the GPU may actually just be the same entity. So you really need to be careful also when you use target um, update um, to basically know exactly when the GPU is working on something versus when the host may actually start working on it. And that's why on, the, on one of the previous slides, we actually had um, the update on the host um, after each of the kernels. And when Christian will add no wait, you need to be careful so that uh, you don't introduce any race conditions between a kernel that is running asynchronously on a GPU and a potential host update. Because while the GPU is working on the data, um, you may see any you know garbage values in between. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you're basically subject to race conditions. Now, not between open and P threads on the host, but you know, also with the open and P threads running on a GPU. Yes, so Michael, that's, um, thanks. That's a very important uh, remark. So I think last time I said, yeah, in OpenMP this is called map because it's not always a copy. Yeah? And I have to admit in my explanations, I often explain data as being copied from the host to the device. Yeah, because this is and yeah, uh, on, on some machines uh, still the case, but it ha doesn't have to be. So thinking of this mapping as a transfer of ownership um, uh, makes it compatible also with future and uh, to some extent also core GPU architectures. Yeah, it's not always a copy. Yeah, it's a mapping that means uh, we transfer the ownership also of this variable. Yeah? No, yeah, this is a P of the GPU. And here we transfer the ownership and also the content back to the host. So why isn't P in your list of arguments for the init function? Why P is not in the list of arguments? Because it's the host P? Because it's Winter? only initializing V1 and V2. Right. It doesn't need, need P, yeah? So init initializes the input, yeah, P is probably the, the output at the end. So we don't need it here. Yeah, but if, if this piece of code is in a different file, it doesn't know about P. It doesn't know about P. Unless you have, you have an include or... I think you found a typo. That is correct, yeah. So we shortened this code uh, too much. So there's a declaration missing. You're right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that was the first complaint and we have shown this slide a couple of times. All right. Just checking. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we, we need that in, in it. Yeah, yeah. If we are look at Thank you. Okay. So Michael was talking about race conditions. Yeah. <laughs> So far, everything was synchronous. That means either the host was busy or the device was busy. There was nothing in between. Now, yeah, we want to get both busy. And then that means we can get um, race conditions. 
So let me talk about, uh, to some extent, synchronization between the host and the device. So by default, all target constructs are synchronous operations. That means uh, they are executed when they are uh, encountered in the code. It's like an OMP task with an if zero. Yeah? Do not defer execution, do it right now. Yeah? You might remember that. And that means here the host thread, uh, when a synchronous target is being encountered, waits until the uh, GPU kernel, uh, the data movement, whatever, has completed. However, yeah, sometimes we do not want it. In particular, if you have multiple GPUs, um, let's say multi-socket, many core hosts, yeah, and uh, even though the GPUs are really expensive uh, nowadays, you, you still also paid for the host. You should get those CPUs busy as well. And that means we might want to do um, asynchronous offloading. That means both asynchronous kernel execution and maybe even more important, asynchronous data transfer. And in order to do that, you can add the no wait clause to an OpenMP target construct, for example, to actually achieve an asynchronous execution of the kernel. That means uh, the kernel will start on the device and the host can uh, continue. Uh, so this is the synchronous. Uh, and uh, that's a standard behavior. And now we are going to make that an asynchronous um, offload. So where do we have it here? Uh, we have the target data construct starting here. We have the target data end here. And now we have two kernels, target no weight, target no weight. Uh, that means those kernels can start immediately and the host um, can continue. Now uh, we, we still need some mechanisms or we might need some mechanisms to actually bring some order uh, back to the chaos. And uh, in the context of OpenMP tasking, we learned about dependencies uh, that were modeled in a way to express the data flow so that we can actually ensure that certain tasks can only be executed uh, when other tasks have completed. Yeah? And we were explaining that with uh, data being produced and consumed, for example. This is a way of uh, uh, thinking. In OpenMP, we call that independencies and out uh, dependencies. Yeah. So simple things first, the no wait clause here put on a target construct specify that the encountering thread, that is a host thread, does not wait for the target region, yeah, this kernel, to complete, yeah, but it will let me call it, pack this task up, send it to the GPU and continue. Do the same here, pack this up, send it to the GPU and continue. Here's the end of the target uh, data region. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so now we have to synchronize uh, that. So why is that important? Just a remark on, on, let's say, truly heterogeneous computing. So I believe uh, that it's uh, important to utilize CPUs and GPUs uh, to the best possible extent. Yeah? Admittedly, this is often a challenge. So in particular, uh, if you have a large workload, like here, matrix vector multiplication, uh, the CPU is computationally much more powerful. It might have limitations on what it can store in its fast memory and so, uh, so on. So load balancing between the CPU and the GPU constantly uh, is a challenge. Yeah? And the solution, um, of how much work to put on a GPU and how much work to put on a CPU, unfortunately, always depends on the relative performance of the CPU and GPU, and in consequence, also of the number of CPUs and number of GPUs in the uh, system. Yeah? So that's not trivial, but OpenMP at least gives you some means to express uh, what you have uh, in the code. Yeah, so asynchronous means the uh, operation is triggered and the control returns immediately. <clears throat> and this asynchronous um, support in OpenMP allows us to really make use of this heterogeneous computing as defined earlier. So this is a synchronous flow. Yeah, we need to make it sure the control flow is being transferred from the host to the GPU. Here it's idling. And this is an asynchronous uh, control flow. So the GPU is active, but the CPU can continue uh, with compute. 
This is <coughs> what you should always have in mind. Yeah? But you can also uh, make use of that to actually uh, utilize the bottleneck, yeah? be it the PCI or any other uh, link in between the host and the device to fully utilize it. So for in the case of PCI transfers, you can do asynchronous data movement in parallel or simultaneously from host to device and from the device back to the host. Yeah? So you have more than just a single data movement uh, active. If you like, you can even overlap uh, the transfer of data and the computation. Yeah? More, even more tricky, yeah? but even more important for uh, performance. So assume you have a large computational task in the sense that it's that the data can't be represented on the high bandwidth memory of the GPU. So you have to put it into chunks, uh, transfer chunks, and uh, then call the co corresponding compute kernel. So what you could do is an asynchronous transfer of the data, asynchronous of, uh, call of the first compute, and then asynchronous transfer of the next chunk of the data to the next chunk of compute and so forth to actually make sure that you fully utilize uh, the GPU compute kernel and also data transfer between the host and the um, device. Yeah? And finally, if you have, uh, depending on your workload, you might want to execute multiple kernels, maybe of, uh, of a different uh, type on the GPU at the same time. This is also what you can do with asynchronous offloads. Yeah? That uh, depends, of course, uh, on how much resources an individual kernel invocation consumes. So much for the theory. Yeah? Now let me show you how this looks like uh, in OpenMP. We talked about, I just have to uh, interrupt you for a second. Ewe, bitte aufhören. Sorry. Yeah. So asynchronous operations uh, with are being expressed in OpenMP with tasks. We can express dependencies in between with a depend clause. And if you want to wait for tasks, yeah, that means uh, um, for all previously generated sibling tasks, we have the task wait construct. Remember what we talked about um, earlier. Let's see what happens here. Yeah? So here we have a Pragma OMP target map yeah? with a no wait. That means it issues a data transfer. And now uh, this could happen what uh, Michael was being saying earlier. So if you uh, issue an asynchronous uh, transfer and continue to work on the data, be it on the host or the device, yeah? the data might still be, let me call it in flight. So it means if you start to update the data on the host, you don't know uh, which version will be transferred. And if you start to consume the data on the device, you're not sure if everything has been fully transferred. Yeah? So there are many good things that come with asynchronicity, but it also um, makes things a little bit more uh, complicated. In order to order things, yeah, we can have an out dependency. So that means when this target map, uh, asynchronous target map is completed, it can um, it provides the data. Yeah? Here we make use of uh, GPU data as a, maybe a dummy variable, maybe a real data variable. So that means other tasks yeah, depend on. Uh, oh, sorry, there's another task. So uh, the, here, yeah, this task depends on the GPU data. So it can only be issued yeah, um, after this one has been completed. Same for this. This is a task probably working on the host. Yeah? Uh, it provides CPU data. This one consumes data. So here, this task can only um, start after the two previous tasks have completed. And this one will wait for all sibling tasks. And what I implicitly said and want to make explicit now is that you can mix and match the, the dependencies between the host and the device. Yeah, this is really important. Let me look at, I think, only two more code examples. Yeah? So we have, again, uh, very fancy names. So we have an asynchronous vector multiplication. Yeah, that's the idea here. We have a target uh, region somewhere outside. So we say target enter data. We allocate v1 and uh, v2. We do a compute v1, v2 yeah, with a, a target on the device, asynchronous. So that means the host um, uh, continues immediately after the compute kernel has been uh, started. 
but this one produces v1 and v2. This is an uh, OpenMP task, so it does something on the host. Yeah? Uh, and here we have to assume that it does not involve v1 and v2, yeah? because this is now being uh, induced by another task. Here we have uh, uh, another target map. Yeah? Let me see it with a no weight. Uh, so this depends on v1 and v2. So, sorry, a target region yeah, with maps T from the host, uh, from the device to the host at the very end. But this one depends uh, because it wants to consume V1 and V2 on the completion of this uh, kernel here. Uh, so that means we're reading V1 and V2, and this task rate will wait for all um, uh, uh, previously generated tasks. And we, uh, at the end, yeah, release the data. That means destroy the environment, data environment on the uh, device. So we can mix and match execution on the device and on the host. We can express dependencies where data is being produced and then uh, consumed. Yeah? And <coughs> I was just uh, confused with the curly braces. This means the target applies to just, uh, or the target kernel consists of just here the compute function. But of course, we can have curly braces specifying uh, let's say the code of the target uh, kernel in um, yeah in line. Uh, finally, yeah, this is a little bit um, um, slightly more complicated now. Adding uh, the target update, yeah, which can also uh, be used with a depend clause. So this is um, this has been upgraded in a later version of an OpenMP specification to be potentially also an asynchronous task. Uh, so what did we add here? We update um, v1 and v2 um, when as soon as v1 and v2 have been provided. Yeah? That means when this task provides v1 and v2, this one will update it uh, from the device to the host, yeah? to the update on the host. This is a task yeah, that depends again yeah, on v1 and v2. So why in and out? This one depends. Yeah, on those being provided and also provides them, um, obviously because it uh, copies data from the device to the host. Here we have a task on the host that is um, needs for the data available on the host, yeah? uh, does something with v1 and v2, probably an update, uh, because it's also providing again uh, the data here. Yeah? If it would just consume that, we could uh, uh, change this dependency to be an only an in dependency. This is now an update from the device back to the host. Yeah, v1 and v2 are being uh, 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 mapped back from the device to the host. Again, we need an in-out dependency here because this one has to be completed. And finally, we do something on the device again. Here we only need an independency because nothing else is doing something with v1 and v2 in this particular example. So this is, uh, does this make sense? Probably not, yeah? This is constantly switching the control flow back between the host and the device. There's not, not a lot going on in any asynchronous manner here, but this example is just meant to illustrate uh, how to make use of uh, enter data, exit data, uh, no weight target uh, tasks, uh, target constructs, and uh, also target updates, and putting depend clauses in between all of them. Yeah. Oops, so this will come at the very end. Questions on that at this point in time? So there was only one question that I already answered in Slack, and that was um, you haven't been showing device classes for most of the constructs. And so um, if you don't have a device class, OpenMP picks a default device. Right. And that is um, you know, one of the GPUs um, that has um, ID zero. So that is a number that OpenMP gives you. Uh, but there is a device class. Uh, I think you've seen traces in the syntax slides at some point where you can give a device ID. So you can, each of the directives that Christian was showing basically also allows you to specifically target a device numbered from zero to n minus one, with n being the number of GPUs that you have in the system, so that you can control if you have multiple uh, data allocations going, which 
device you want to target. And there's also, if you still want to use the default device without the device clauses, then you can use environment variables or um, an API routine that I put in the chat um, to basically set um, the default device if you desire that it's not supposed to be zero. That was just um, for the recording, the answer that I gave in Slack. Very good, Mike. All right, Thank and with you. that, I think I'm up anyways, right? Yes. Yes, you are. All right, so let me share my screen. Does it come through? All right, so um, hybrid programming. So what do I mean by this? Um, so the idea, am I sharing this, the right screen? Yes. Hybrid okay. programming. Yeah, thank you. Um, for some reason, Zoom is uh, misbehaving right now. Okay, so hybrid programming. So what do I mean by this? Um, so first of all, it is not like, you know, MPI plus OpenMP, which is like one of the traditional uh, HPC hybrid models. This is really like um, merge, using another language, uh, a low level language in this uh, specific example, uh, for GPU programming and how that may interact with the OpenMP API. So for instance, you know, um, using HIP, this, this, this will be the, the main example for, the, for my slides going forward, but this works also with CUDA, OpenCL, uh, Circle, and potentially other um, programming languages, uh, low-level programming languages, um, and also um, library invocations like you know, calling into a blast routine that is supplied um, by the hip blast or rock blast libraries or kublas or um, you know any other uh, GPU enabled um, library. And so, what OpenMP helps you with are these two interactions that I'm going to show in this slide deck. There are more, but they are like you know more like corner cases for very specific um, applications or. Uh, programming exercises. So the first one is <clears throat> how you can call a low-level kernel from OpenMP application code. And to me, that is kind of the main use case. Um, so think of um, your application being written in OpenMP for host, and then you start using OpenMP for using your GPU. And then you basically recognize we are, you know, so, say via a performance tool, that for some reason the OpenMP compiler is not providing you the performance that you desire, or that there is a specific low-level feature of your GPU. Think of you know um, matrix units or tensor units uh, that OpenMP uh, doesn't provide you access with, and the compiler doesn't automatically um, leverage those. So in those cases, you may want to you know write a specific kernel using a low-level language so that you can exploit these additional features or get to the performance that you, that you desire. The other use case that works equally well is calling OpenMP kernels from low level application code. Um, so this is, you have written your application in say HIP as the main programming model to interact with, with uh, GPUs. And now you either want to develop new code using OpenMP or you want to achieve more portability by um, you know, migrating a specific HIP kernel back to OpenMP, but keeping the rest of the application code as it is. All right, so let me show you um, an example how, how this may look like. So the first thing, you know, I'm, I'm gonna stay with a very simple example like Saxby. Um, so here, you know, this is like you know, a, a bunch of mockup code. So pretty much we do target data map, uh, you know, all the mapping that, that Christian was talking about. Then we have two compute kernels, one and two, that somehow update X and Y on the GPU. And then we want to compute Saxby and then do a third kernel uh, um, computing on the result. And like you've seen before, you know, the Saxby code would look like uh, roughly like this with target teams distribute parallel for SIMD inside to parallelize the Saxby loop or you know, and any other flavor of uh, parallel loops on the GPU. You could also um, write pragma omp target teams loop, for instance, if you want to um, give the compiler more freedom. 
And now let's just assume for a second um, that um, we want to rewrite this function in a low level language like hip. Um, quite honestly, for Saxby and these kind of things, uh, there is no specific need because the compiler will actually pretty much figure out how to map this ideally to a GPU. But let's say the kernel is more complicated, potentially involves you know, some um, low level barrier or synchronization code. And so you have a, a certain need to rewrite that in your, in your low level language. All right, so let me first show you how that thing would look like as a hip kernel. So there's two, two pieces to this. So there's this double under global double under void Saxby kernel. So that is the, the kernel code that receives um, pretty much the same arguments as before. So the size, uh, the, the, the scalar and the two um, vectors. And then it uses the standard hip CUDA OpenCL style uh, kernel programming technique where we have thread IDX uh, block IDX and block dim to basically compute the if the the location at which in the in the in the parallel loop the kernel should be executed. That gives us the iteration i, and so you know all instances of this kernel then correspond to the full loop execution. Pretty much what you know um, from from your past CUDA and HIP experience. All right, and you know I'm using just the dot x notation because this is a one di one dimensional kernel. The second part <clears throat> is the sexp hip um, function call. So the double under global kernel function was compiled for the GPU, and the second function sexp underscore hip is now compiled for the host, and it uses the triple chevron syntax to invoke the kernel, the sexp kernel on the GPU. And so what it does is it basically goes in and um, you know, this distributes this into uh, n divided by 256 number of blocks, right? The block dimension is 256. And so you basically now have like 256 threads per block and you have as many blocks um, as we can fit the 256 into that into that um, n variable um, of iterations. Um, for this, for sake of implicity and to avoid, you know, some some additional tuning stunts, I also assume that two fifty six evenly divides n, so that I don't have to, to do any remainder handling or any any tricks of that sort, um, so that the kernel can stay nice and clean. But I guess you get the point, right? Now, the difficulty is that these things are device pointers. And so when you listen to what Christian was saying, um, when we call an OpenMP kernel, um, we basically just pass the host pointer into that, into that kernel. And then OpenMP does the magic under the hood to basically make sure that it somehow knows for the kernel invocation, what are the actual buffers that you have mapped using target data constructs, target ender data, target exit data constructs, and so forth, um, so that the connection between the host data and the kernel data or the GPU data is, is maintained. All right, so basically that means we need to find a way how we can translate the host pointer that was mapped by OpenMP directives um, and how we can, from that, retrieve the associated device pointer. Let me make this a little more clearer to give you a, a, an example that's hopefully clearing things up. So under the hood, what OpenMP does is called pointer translation. So when you create um, a data environment on the device, OpenMP automatically creates and maintains a mapping between the memory pointer on the host. So if you launch your debugger and you inspect the variable A, that is your array, uh, you'll see some pointer or in this case, I'm using X on my slides. Um, so you'll see X is pointing to A, B, C, D as one of the potential addresses um, in your process space. And then when you do something like this, pragma on target map two of this um, entity X, and here I'm having a crude mix of C, C++ syntax and Fortran syntax, uh, kind of split brain between the two worlds. Um, what OpenMP does for you is this. So in the device memory, it creates an X, the device version of this, of this entity X. 
that has a different physical or virtual address on the GPU, in this case, EF12. And what it also does for you is under the hood, it maintains a mapping table that basically says anytime you refer to X in a device memory, and you basically mean this X uh, coming from the host, uh, OpenMP should translate that to this device pointer so that we can run the kernel on the GPU and that it actually refers to the actual buffer um, that you allocated using the uh, Pragma OMP target data construct. And so what we need for the kernel invocation in case of HIP is exactly this, right? So this is what we need for the kernel invocation. This is what a HIP kernel will expect. It doesn't care about where this thing is coming from, right? It only, it only cares about, you know, the actual address of the data block that you want to work on as part of the kernel invocation on the, on the GPU device. If you would do this explicitly, you would do things like, you know, um, malloc for X to create the host memory, then do a hip malloc to create a device allocation of a certain kind, and then do hip mem copies um, to basically move data around. And this is what OpenMP actually does on under the hood for you. It basically does all this hip malloc, hip mem copy mem memory management um, for you and tries to figure out when we actually have to move data and if we have to move data at all. So that seems, that's quite convenient. <clears throat> all right, so we need the device pointer <clears throat> and we need a way to um, tell OpenMP that when we, when, that we want this, this special value and that we don't, for, for a specific uh, piece of code, that we don't care about the host pointer, but we care about the device pointer that is behind a variable like X. All right, so the way to do this is in OpenMP, there is the use device PDR clause, um, which can stick at a target data construct. So what we can do is say we somehow allocate this X at the same address as on the previous slide, A, B, C, D, and then we do pragma target use device PDR on X. What now happens is that OpenMP goes in, looks up the actual value of X, so that is APCD. It goes into the mapping table. In that mapping table, it looks up the corresponding device address or the device pointer and substitutes in, in between the opening curly brace and the closing curly brace. It swaps out the original value of X and it swaps in the device value or the device pointer value um, of that variable and so inside these curly braces, you're no longer referring to the host entity, but you actually have the device pointer. So that means if example func, in my case, is a regular function that is running on the host, it will likely blow up and will not work correctly because what you passed in as a pointer has no valid interpretation in host memory anymore. If it has, it's likely not going to point to the right location that you think it would be pointing to. It's a device pointer in between those curly braces, All right? Um, however, if example func is a host function that just takes X and passes it on to a hip kernel, you'll be fine because the hip kernel will look at this, um, the value that you pass in as a function argument to the kernel. It will interpret that as a device address. And because it's a device address, um, it can dereference it, it can interpret um, that value, and it will have a correct interpretation as a memory location on the GPU. So if you think about this, you can think of, you know, when you do the device, uh, use device PDR uh, translation mechanism, that inside the kernel braces, the pointer variable, the original X, is shadowed by a new X that now contains the device pointer instead of the host pointer. Now, if you put this together, it will look like this, right? So we have the allocate device memory again. Um, so, you know, I retain the original map and uh, map to from clauses. Um, and then I added, um, I replaced the original Saxby implementation that used to call the OpenMP kernel with this uh, kernel 
uh, with the host trampoline function that contains the triple chevron syntax and then in turn invokes the GPU kernel. What I also added on this slide is this additional target data construct that I was showing on the previous slide that basically says translate X and Y from the host pointers to the corresponding device pointers. And to illustrate the effect and the values that you observe when you look at those variables, say in a debugger, um, I basically you know, re reuse the same ABCD values that I was already using on previous slides. And so let's assume for X that we allocated that at the same known address ABCD. So anytime from the allocation up here to this point here, when you inspect X, it will have the value ABCD. And what OpenMP does once it did the data mapping for this map clause up here, it, will has, it, it, it has a mapping table that has an entry for X that basically says the host address ABCD is mapped to EX12 on the target device. And when you look at X, like I said, it will contain ABCD. And a similar argument you can make, of course, with different addresses for why, but I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to bore you uh, too much. Now, when we target, when we hit the target data with the use device PDRX class, the mapping table will still contain the same information. That doesn't change, right? OpenMP will still maintain the information that variable X is a mapping from ABCD, the host version, the original host version of that variable, and EF12 the corresponding device version of that variable. But when you inspect um, the actual value of the X variable down here, you will recognize that it is um, printing EF12 in the debugger, or you know, if you do printf on the variable as a pointer, uh, you will recognize that the, the variable has changed. And now this is now a device pointer that uh, the hip kernel can successfully uh, dereference and execute uh, the kernel code using those um, those data areas. All right, quick check. Are there any questions? I don't see any in Slack. And I don't see any in the meeting chat. All right, so. There was a question, and I think that the person deleted it. I think he got answer from your presentation <laughs> that's up. that's that's good if there are more questions please uh don't hesitate and, and uh type them into slack but if you want to interpret the question was about why do you want to use openmp with other languages such as CUDA together are there any example cases um yes um so like i said um so one of the things um that that i mean compilers are are trying hard uh, to produce the best possible code, but sometimes they just don't see the pattern that you as the programmer had in mind um, when you tried, uh, when you when you implemented a certain piece of code, right? So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a compiler writer at AMD. So basically, you know, the hard part for, for us in the compiler is to figure out what was the programmer thinking uh, when they wrote a piece of code so that we can infer the context and the the true boundary conditions of the code so that we understand better what the code is what the code actually means right and that's a really hard part for a compiler um, I, I guess I will also have a bunch of info uh, a bunch of statements about this also when we talk when, when we resume the SIMD talk um, at least I'm gonna repeat uh, um, a bunch of those those previous slides um, that's one use case. And so in, in that case, you know, it may happen that the compiler does not figure out um, a particular code generation pattern that you as the programmer wanted. So um, for instance, you know, um, AMD GPUs and NVIDIA GPUs, um, the same, um, they have um, AMD calls this local data store. Um, NVIDIA, I think calls it like um, cache or something. Um, where you can allocate um, variables, you can you can basically tell the compiler or the, the kernel to allocate a bunch of you know uh, values in, in in that special in that special storage area of the cache 
Um, so for instance, in, in, in hip and CUDA, this is called double under shared double under, right? So that's a very specific memory arena that typically is mapped into a part of the L2 cache um, of the execution engines. Um, OpenMP can actually leverage this. So um, say the LLVM compiler, for instance, is able to figure out that when you like declare um, a variable with team local scope, um, in several cases, it, it is able to figure out that it should put um, that variable into that fast storage arena of the GPU. In other cases, it, it may not be able to figure that out. So in that case, if you really care about the variables being allocated there and you need it for performance, what you would do is you would basically rewrite the OpenMP kernel, use the explicit low level language like hip, and then place double, double under share double under in front of your variable declaration to tell the hip compiler that you want to allocate that, um, that variable in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the AMD case in, in local data store. Um, another case is um, accessing um, in features that are not really accessible from the OpenMP specification or from the OpenMP language, like tensor units, like matrix multiply units, um, like uh, global device barriers. OpenMP doesn't, doesn't officially support that at this point. Um, there may be special instructions like uh, permutations or shuffle instructions um, that sometimes compilers have a hard time figuring out. And so all these, um, or, or special atomics, so all these kind of very low level features that are very specific to a particular GPU type uh, and maybe even generation um, are hard to access from OpenMP because OpenMP is more agnostic to those. Um, and so for those cases, uh, you may need this. And then third use case is if you want to invoke a library um, like the BLAST, li like BLAST libraries like HIPPLAST or ROCKBLAST or ROCKFFT. Um, these uh, libraries, if you want to call them from an OpenMP data environment, all need these kind of um, translation mechanisms so that you know you can pass it an actual device pointer into the hip uh, rock blast DGEM function, for instance, um, and then invoke um, our special AMD special um, um, implementation of, say, DGEM for instance. So there's a, a whole variety of use cases where you want to make a transition from an OpenMP data environment into the low level data environment that is then based on, on um, only device pointers. All right, uh, that was a bit lengthy and kind of a, also a recap of what I, what I said earlier on uh, when I introduced this, this topic. All right, that was so- very good, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so advanced task synchronization. This is going to be a little bit of a brain twister. I know that, I appreciate that. So bear with me for a second. Um, and, and really, you know, if you don't get it like immediately, try to think it through. We will have this, uh, the seventh session in, uh, on October 28, I believe it is. Um, and so, you know, you, you will be able to basically nag us with your questions about this as well. Um, but it's it's a very fancy concept how you can um, how you can um, make OpenMP interact with an asynchronous MPI a API. So um, there's several APIs that have asynchronous operations. So there's MPI, probably most notably with MPI I send and I receive, and then MPI wait. Um, to basically see if um, a certain MPI operation is complete. There is a ton of asynchronous IO libraries where you basically fire up an IO operation and then later on you can wait for it while you continue with your computation. The IO subsystem is somehow working through uh, your IO request. Uh, then there is HIPCUDA and OpenCL. They also have stream-based offloading. So that means you basically have a stream object. Uh, you enqueue those kernels into the stream object. I didn't specifically talk about this in the Sexby kernel, but if you, if you ever use those programming models, 
Uh, you may already know that you can have multiple of those stream streaming engines and each of the streaming engine itself is in order. So executes the kernel in order, but the, the, the number of streaming engines is asynchronous. And so they also are asynchronous towards the OpenMP execution that is taking place in the OpenMP world. So in general, um, you know, any OpenMP API <clears throat> or programming model that executed executes asynchronously with OpenMP is kind of part of this of this asynchronous API interaction that I'm going to talk about. And so let me show you um, an example with hip memory transfers. So say I have three functions. So do something, do something else, and do some other important stuff. Um, so you know this is really a, a contrived mock-up example uh, with no real purpose. And so let's say in between those do something um, operations, what you want to do is you want to bring back some mem copy operation um, from the device to the host. So basically you want to move memory uh, from the GPU back to host memory. And so what you do so that you can, you know, uh, keep the uh, DMA engine and hardware busy while you do something else. You basically fire up a mem copy async, and then at some point when you do, um, you want to execute do other important stuff on the memory that you brought back from the GPU. You have to put in a hip stream synchronize to make sure that the memory operation actually completed before you continue on the host. And let's also assume for a second that we see that there's more parallelism, especially between do something and do something else. You may want to wrap those in OpenMP tasks so that you can exploit multiple cores um, in your system. And so the question is that everything boils down to, how can we synchronize completion events? So we have a completion event here. Um, oh, well, basically the completion event is, event is somewhere down here. Uh, when this operation actually finishes, but the hip stream synchronize basically detects or is the way for you to detect um, that completion event. So the question is, how can we synchronize open exec OpenMP execution with the completion events occurring in this other asynchronous world of, of hip? So how we can, can we marry the asynchronous API hip with the parallel task model of OpenMP? So let me do a first try. So what we do is we put in task A. So basically we wrap the do something in task A. We also put the hip mem copy async into that task. We recognize that do something else can run concurrently to do something. So that's gonna be task B. And then we wrap do other important stuff in task C and put the hip stream synchronized in there. And I'll give you a second to think through, well, a little more than that, maybe 30 seconds, to think through if that actually works. If you think it works, put a thumbs up. If you, if you think it doesn't work, uh, what is the other reaction? Is there a thumbs down or something? Some negative reaction, please. can also of course speak up, unmute and speak up if you think you see the problem. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? So will this this um, work um, or is, is, is this gonna break? Hmm. So if task A and task C are running at the same time, you can't have a synchronized and a async at the same time. They're not gonna be in sync. I think you, you got it, yes. So the problem is you have a race condition between task A and C. So B, you can, you can pretty much ignore that's safe. Um, 
But basically, you know, task C may start executing before task A enqueues the memory transfer. And so what then will happen is, especially if, if do something causes a considerable delay and it's not a very quick function, um, there's a high probability that what will happen is that you will have hip stream synchronize in task C when it's ex scheduled for execution. First thing it does is it looks at the queue, at the stream. There is no um, event or no operation in the stream that it can actually complete. So hip stream synchronize will happily return and say, you know, uh, nothing to synchronize with. Uh, you will start do other important stuff. And, you know, by the time potentially the hip mem copy async kicks in and starts transferring data. So either, you know, you look at outdated data in that function down here, or you see some in-between state of, you know, how, how mem copy async actually moves the data into your uh, host memory. And so you can actually see potentially see how the data is changing while you um, iterate through the data and you get um, likely garbage out of this. All right, so that does not work. How about this one? So Christian and I were talking quite a bit about task dependencies. So we talked about this in the tasking uh, session um, of the OpenMP series. Um, and he also repeated that same concept in the, in the context of uh, target no wait. So basically what we do here is we basically have a task A, again, that does something. It also does the hip mem copy async. But now what we do is we have an output dependency on the stream object or you know some other variable. I'm just using the stream object because I have it in hand. Um, and we have this um, input dependency on task C. So what now will happen is we now will make sure that task C does not execute before task A is actually compute, is, is actually done um, computing. Will that work? Don't you have the same issue as before? If task C, uh... Mm. No, no, that might work actually. Well, now we have with the data dependency or the, the task dependency, we can ensure that A is running before C. So that's all fine. Right. That's not a big deal. So that seems fine. Does but, C need to wait for B? Um, C doesn't have, no, B is completely disconnected. It doesn't have a task dependency. So it can be scheduled at any time. In relation to those three tasks or the two A and B, A and C tasks, B can run any time. It's uh, completely disconnected. It's completely um, independent. So there's, <clears throat> there's a um, comment in the, in the meeting chat that says issues with load balancing, maybe. You're probably right. And I, I'll, I'll take it as the right answer. So this actually works, right? So we know that um, task C will not start executing before do something is complete, the first step of task A. And task A will not be completed before the hip mem copy async is actually in the stream and executing. Um, or scheduled for execution via the stream, I should say. Um, and task C will only start executing once task A has completed. So that's all cool. The problem is more that while the hip mem copy async is running, the hip stream synchronize will block task C and will not release the threat that this task is execu uh, executing on. So that means in that scenarios, uh, in that scenario, you will actually lose a threat until the hip stream synchronize is done. Now, if you have a system with like hundreds of cores, you probably don't care about one or two cores uh, that much. 
But you know, as you build up those those large scale applications, you may be actually um, in a situation where a considerable amount of the cores will be stuck in Hipstream synchronized, potentially waiting for uh, the asynchronous API to uh, finish up. And while that happens, no other, th um, this particular thread that is executing task C and therefore is blocked in Hipstream synchronized will not take on other tasks that are lingering in your task pool um, and wait for um, execution to happen, right? So this may work, but it takes away execution while, this, while the system is handling the data transfer. And it may also be problematic if the called interface is not fully threat safe. And if there are boundary conditions on whether you can call the waiting function from multiple threads at the same time, should you wait for multiple events to occur. So it could be, it could be sensitive um, to that. What OpenMP5 did was it introduced the concept of a detachable task. So what you can do there is you can uh, detach a task from an executing thread without considering the detached task to be completed. So if I go back here, right? So at this closing curly brace, what usually happens in the lifetime of a task, while we are in between the curly braces, you can think of the task of being executed, right? And then at the closing curly brace, you can think of the task transitioning from the executing state to the completed state, which basically then tells OpenMP that all the data dependencies, the waiting relations um, of that particular task that just completed are fulfilled. So if we can now detach a task and basically keep the task in sort of a state variable, after it released the thread that it was executing on, but before it kind of distributes the completion events, we stop the threads in that, that task inside a variable and we kind of confine it into that variable. Think of it as, you know, half chokingly being a zombie task. It's not alive, so it's no longer executing but it's not in quotation marks dead yet because it's trapped in this intermediate state between life and death, okay? So, you know, that's why zombie is potentially um, a, good, a good analogy. So basically, you know, we can now um, catch a task right before it's being completed and, and save that state. And now we can add a runtime API to basically programmatically send the, 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 the task from that pre-completed state into the completed state and fulfill all its waiting, waiting relationship. So there is the omp event D data type. That's the variable or the type for a variable that is capable of holding such a uh, trapped task. Then there is the detach clause that basically takes a variable of omp event t data type and stores the, th the task into that variable right after it releases the thread after being executed, but before it is being completed. And then a, run a runtime API fulfill event that basically takes a variable like this and basically pushes the task over uh, and releases it from its trapped state into completed state. So here's it, here's an example. So what happens here is this. So at the closing curly brace with the detach event clause added to it and event being the variable um, to, hold the, to hold the task, the task detaches um, after it executes in quotation mark, the closing curly brace and is trapped in the event variable. The task wait cannot complete. It is waiting for the detached task to complete, but since it's trapped in the variable, it will not complete, and therefore the task wait uh, cannot continue. Then somewhere else, we call OpenMP fulfill event on that event variable. So we signal um, the, the task in that variable that it's, that it's now okay to proceed to completion. And when that happens, the task wait can continue because the task it was waiting for has completed. 
I hope that makes sense. So basically, you know, after executing the task, we stop the, the task right there. It releases the threat to something else, but it, the, the task itself is stored in that variable. And with OpenMP fulfill event, we can release the task into the completed state and, you know, get rid of it in the system. And everything that is waiting for it, like task weights, task groups, task dependencies, will wait for that trap task to continue to completion to then consider um, the rating relationship or the task dependency to be fulfilled. Now, how does it help um, in our case? So if you put everything together in task A, what we do is we touch on a variable hip event. In task A, what we also do is we put in hip stream at callback um, and basically put in a callback uh, function that is triggered whenever the memcopy async is done. So basically we remove the hip stream synchronized down here and we replace it by hip stream at callback. So what this now does is task A will start executing. It will do something. It will NQ async, the memcopy async operation. And right after that operation, it will introduce this callback operation so that when async is done, um, the callback will fire. That's the in-order property that I mentioned about um, hipstream. Then task B is disconnected from everything um, else as usual. And then before task C, we put in a task wait so that uh, task C will only start executing um, one A, once A and B have been completed. Now, what happens is due to the detach clause, at this point, task A detaches. So that means it is now stored in the variable hip event. The threat that it was executing on is available to other tasks for execution. The task wait does not continue. The semantics mandate that it has to wait for task A and B to complete. B will eventually complete once it's done with do something else, but task A will not complete because it, we stuck it into that hip event variable at the closing curly brace. Now, up here in the callback, what we put in the callback is you know, a bit of clumsy uh, pointer handling to reconstruct from the callback data argument, the actual um, event variable, but regardless of that, you know, once we know that the callback is being triggered by the stream in HIP, um, it will basically release task A from its waiting state so that the task wait down at the bottom can continue because now also task A is considered completed in the system. Second slide, pretty much the same thing, same explanation. The only thing that I changed is that I removed the task weight down here and replaced it with um, a dependency clause like I was showing previously um, in the working example that took away the threat. So now, you know, I'm waiting on the DST, so the destination buffer as the task dependency. And so same reasoning, you know, at the closing curly brace, the task detaches and task C will not execute because it has an unfulfilled dependency on A. Um, remember that at the closing curly brace, due to the detach clause, the task is not completed, but stored into that variable. And then, you know, once the hip stream uh, callback uh, triggers, we call OpenMP fulfill event, that thing, um, releases the threat, uh, the task A, and then task C um, considers its input dependency fulfilled because task A completed via the callback mechanism. And I think with that, we're pretty much out of time, right? Um, shall we move the case study to um, our flow overflow catch all session seven? Yeah, I would support that. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, right. let's do that. OK, so back to you, Christian, um, for the um, homework assignment. Uh, well, there's 
just one slide on that. Mm -hmm. Let me try to share that. So the task is simple. Yeah, do whatever you can and whatever you learned uh, last time and this time to make the code run as fast as you can. Yeah? So you know the 80-20 hmm, rule, whatever, yeah, it's getting much harder. So you have uh, seen me improving the runtime from 100, what was it, 45 to something like 5.5 seconds. Um, uh, a similar improvement is not possible anymore, but you could think of optimizing for more than uh, for a particular GPU, making use of two or even four GPUs, depending on your node type, and also utilizing the host simultaneously. Yeah? This is all possible. Just uh, to clarify that utilizing the host and the GPU simultaneously is not profitable under all systems or let's say for small data sets, yeah? just to warn you, but we can discuss it uh, next time if you're interested. That's all what we have as homework proposals. Hello, Buset. I think we're we're done. Shall we hand over uh, hand back to you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, everyone. Um, let's thank uh, Christian and Michael for the wonderful presentations. Hope you learned a lot today. And uh, as usual, I've uh, put. Um, survey link in the chat. I'll remind you in the Slack channel as well. And also feel free to continue ask questions in Slack channel and see you in the in the three in three weeks for the last session. Uh, we will let you know the topics. I think we'll uh, share the topics in the Slack channel and also probably update the the event page if there because we have some leftover from previous sessions. We want to put that in the topics list. That's correct.